KFI AM640, it's later with Mo Kelly. We are live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. Kenny Shirey is a third-generation auctioneer who comes from an auction family with California roots. His grandfather started a car auction in San Diego before he was born, and growing up, he was always surrounded by auctions and encouraged to learn to bid call from his own family. You might say he was born to do this. Coming up on October 5th at SoFi Stadium, he will be the resident auctioneer in charge for the annual Boys and Girls Club of Carson Blue Door Bash. And it's my treat to have him join us this evening with a little bit of a preview. Kenny, good to talk to you again. It's been about a year since we last spoke. Yeah, that's right, Mo. Nice to see you, too. Thanks for the warm introduction. Well, speaking of my intro, being an auctioneer is in your blood. What are your memories growing up of seeing other family members perform at auctions? Uh, as a kid, I couldn't really appreciate it. You know, I'd get brought to the car auction and I just never wanted to be there. I, I always wanted to be like the manager, not not actually out there talking fast. But um, it just kind of fell into place that that I ended up being an auctioneer. My brother made me get the get the job when I was about twenty years old, and uh, even though it was in the blood, I I just kind of got pulled into it. And uh, I was very shy as a kid, so I couldn't do presentations uh, in high school and communications class, anything like that. When I had a presentation, I'd usually ditch class or do something silly. Well, the irony is pretty thick, given what you do now. What was the first time that you held the microphone and started at least practicing or moving down the path to where you are now? So I did my first benefit auction uh, uh, it's probably ooh, 13 years ago, and I didn't know if I was going to do it. For months, I was nervous for the day that to come, and I was practicing in my car, and... Uh, it was uh, one heart worldwide. I'll never forget. Get up there and and I start doing the silent auction, and I'm nervous. And the guy and one of the band members, he was a Native American band. He knew he knew that I was nervous, and uh, I was like, "So, you think it's time to bring him in?" He said, "Don't worry, you'll know when it's time. Just relax." And so those were some nice, wise words he gave me. And then. The auction was a success. I conducted for them many times after that. And when, that, when it was done, I knew that I could do it. But until that night, I questioned whether or not I could actually get on a stage in front of people. When you say being able to do it, I know a large part of that is not only your presentation, not only your oration, but being able to read a crowd. What goes into reading a crowd? I mean, how, how do you go about connecting with an audience? Well, it, everything takes experience, correct? Just like how you're able to really guide this this interview very well. Um, it, it, I've been doing it 20 years in front of thousands of audiences, and you just kind of get used to where to go, how fast to, to keep the momentum, how to, when to slow it down, when to tell the joke, to break the ice, when somebody's completely done, when they might bid again to give them a couple extra seconds to think about it. What joke to tell? It, it all just comes with experience. And, and uh, man, I think I've done, in the last two weeks, I think I've done about eight different events. So I feel like I'm that comedian that's, uh, that's just hitting the, hitting the shows every night and is, is very sharp, you know, mid-season. Even though you may do this frequently, you may do show after show after show, I'm quite sure there are still moments where people will surprise you, where unsuspecting bidders come out of nowhere and, and are very generous. What are the surprises in what you do? Well, that's the best thing about what I do is meeting. And that's probably why you're with the Boys and Girls of Carson, because you, you meet such kind hearted people that restore your faith in humanity, you know, like all the time. And. And even though I do a lot of these events, each one of them I take very personal and serious because they're fighting a good fight. So we're not trying. I was a club kid growing up, so that's always near and dear to my heart. So, you know, my parents split up when I was young. 
And uh, without the Boys and Girls Club, we wouldn't really have somewhere safe to go after after school while she was working full time. So it's uh, it's real easy to be just just overwhelmed with the generosity of people and 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 just really feel that most people are good, kind hearted, don't want to hurt anybody, you know, types of people. So it's really it's really fun. It, that, that's the best part of this gig. People can't see you, but I can. And I saw you light up when you started talking about the Boys and Girls Club. Generally, we're here tonight talking about the Blue Door Bash, which is for the Boys and Girls Club of Carson. But tell me more about your history and experience with the Boys and Girls Club, some of the services that it offered, some of the memories that you may have. Yeah, I'm the youngest of three boys. And I just recall all three of us going to the Boys and Girls Club in San Diego and playing. I remember, I vividly remember digging in the dirt out there just all the time playing. And then, I don't know, that was just something we always liked to do. And as far as the Blue Door Bash, I was telling Nina that I wish all the events that I did were as successful and well-planned like, like that because it was just such a magical moment last year. Being my first year with them, I'm excited to come back because they they know how to put on a good event, you know, cater to people, have good food, good timing, good items. You make mention of Nita Patel, who's the vice president of development for the Boys and Girls Club of Carson. It is a world class event and we're going to have some world class items and opportunities oh, yeah. for people to bid on, not only in the silent auction, but the live auction. And this is, I don't know, maybe the sixth or seventh year I've done it with the Boys and Girls Club of Carson. So I am really excited and expected because I know what's going to happen. You know what's going to happen. But I'm glad we get to be able to talk to this larger KFI and iHeart radio audience so they can get in on it as well. Now, since I said in, in the introduction that you're like the third generation in your family, did the family put that pressure on you to go down this road? Or did you just naturally adopt it and felt compelled to follow that path? No pressure from my family, except except my older brother. I wanted to be a musician when I was a teenager, but you know how that goes. You just you're just really just living in your parents' garage and being a bum. <laughs> so my brother made me. Yeah. My brother made me uh, cut my hair. I had a, like a foot long mohawk, and uh, he goes, "I got you a job at this car auction." And I was about twenty years old, and I said, "Well, I don't want it. I'm I'm fine right here. I like what I'm doing." He goes, "Well, I already told them you're coming. They needed a guy." So. Uh, so a month later, I did that auction, and that, that's who forced me into it. And thank God he did, because now that's how I'm you know, supporting my family and found out that I really love it and that I can do it. So he's the only one that pressured me. If you're just tuning in, my guest right now is Kenny Shirey. You'll be able to see him in action at the Blue Door Bash Gala on October 5th at SoFi Stadium event. I am also emceeing. We'll have more with Kenny Shirey in just a moment. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. It's Later with Mo Kelly. We are live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. My guest is Kenny Shirey, who is going to be the auctioneer at the upcoming Blue Door Bash Gala on October 5th at SoFi Stadium. Full disclosure, I am the MC for that event. I thought it'd be a great opportunity to hear from Kenny, learn about the Boys and Girls Club of Carson and the Blue Door Bash. And Kenny, let me come back to you. I am always intrigued because I know in a general sense what's going to happen, but we both know we don't know what's going to happen because something always surprising and unsuspected and, you know, and unforeseen is going to happen because when the audience gets into it, when the bidders get competitive and the emotions start really running, anything can happen. Tell me about something which made you laugh or surprised you or a memory that you have that always stays with you. Well, last year it was a lot of fun when one of the bidders said, "Hey, I want to, I want to go on that Goodyear blimp also. Let's. I, I know I didn't, I didn't win it, but I want to go." So then there was that thirty second to a minute dialogue saying, "Well, Nina, can we get another one?" Uh, she's on the phone texting her donor, trying to see if she can get one, and and this lady's like, "Yeah, I want another. I want to ride on the Goodyear blimp. So come on." And so that was a that was a funny dialogue back and forth for that thirty forty five seconds, and then. It turned into two prizes. Sometimes, yeah. Then we sold it twice. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes it's funny. You're like, I guess it doesn't even matter what you're buying. 
you know, you go, just go for it at this point. You, you just want to spend your money, and I'm okay with that. And sometimes it's not just that, but it's inclusive of the fact that you just want to beat the other person on the other side of the room because you want to go home with something. There is a competitive spirit when everything is going right that just takes over the room. And this is a fundraiser, yes, for the Boys and Girls Club of America, but it's also a way that we can be advocates for young people everywhere. It's not just about the event. It's about who the event supports. And I've seen the Boys and Girls Club, the young people who started as children and they turn into adults and then they come back years later, like yourself, and then also give back to the community. What else would you say has been so important about how the Boys and Girls Club of America has positively impacted you? Yeah, you hit the nail right on that there, Mo. Um, that I think that's the more important thing about what you're getting for what you're giving. It's what you're giving to. So, um, yeah, like I was mentioning earlier, I don't know what else we could have done to be in a safe environment after school while our mom worked full time, you know, until the evening and picked us up. So uh, not only did it create some friendship at the club where we would play and there's always a, an inclusivity where, you know, you're all, we always felt like we were welcome inside the club. We always had a good time, had different activities, all within that safe space. So, I mean, it sure beat just going home and, being all by ourselves and, and, you know, that, that wasn't really an option until we were a little older. And even then it w we preferred to go to the club and be home by ourselves, you know? So it was just a, something I think that is worth donating to worth giving your time, energy, money, whatever you can to help keep it alive, because it is something that's very special in our, in our country. You getting ready for the blue door bash as am I, which is coming up on October 5th at SoFi Stadium. Have you had a chance to look at the items which will be up for the live auction? And if so, how do you go about preparing for an event such as this? I mean, do you practice with the actual items in mind? Do you write out some sort of script to help you along? How do you go about it? Well, Mo, I don't know if you saw that the silent auction just was launched. So I was looking through that. That's pretty cool. That silent auction's out there. But for the live I typically look over each item and then I create a little sales pitch. Nothing too long because, you know, short and sweet's the way to go. And I just create a little sales pitch for each item. I usually look up that item to kind of get, if I don't know what it is, I look up the hotel. I do my own research on it so I can kind of feel what the package is that they're going to be bidding on and winning. I like to know what it possibly sold for the year prior so that I can kind of have a target in mind and oh and if it was sold the year prior i'd like to know if people who bought it were in the room and if they really enjoyed it so if they can if they would give a testimony for it and say oh yeah i highly recommend that vacation that was worth every single penny and i might buy it again type of thing i like to know if you know if if a donor's there and they like the bidding if we can sell it twice so i ask a donor sometimes i ask a donor hey if what price would make it worth it for you to sell it twice? You know, if there's a spirited competitive bidding, how much would it take for you to donate it again? Mm -hmm. You know, and I would never ask that on the microphone, put the pressure on the donor, but it's something, a nice face to face conversation to have. And sometimes you can get them to donate it again. Um, but either way, I let them know I, I appreciate their donation. Even if, you know, one is, one's good enough, you know, it's better than nothing. It, it's going to make us extra, extra ch cheddar. So, so, yeah, I think uh, that's kind of the, the prep work that I do. I like to get on the phone calls beforehand and um, and kind of get an idea of how the night's going to go, what we're raising money for it specifically as I launch into the paddle race. Because, you know, we do the live auction, and then I'll do the paddle raise after that. I conduct the paddle raise, which is the straight donations. So I like to know how to convey the message that needs to be heard by the crowd, the need that the Boys and Girls Club has for people to donate to that so it's there's definitely two different um attitudes i take fast energetic comedic live auction and then empathetic hey this is why we're all here which i think is the most important part of the night if you would like to see kitty shirey in action you need to go to bgc 
org and become part of this Blue Door Bash, which is coming up on October 5th at SoFi Stadium. I will be the MC once again. Kenny and I will be working together once again. Can't wait for that. So come out and join both of us at the Blue Door Bash Gala on October 5th at SoFi Stadium. Kenny, very quickly, how can people reach you on social media? I also know that you work more broadly with California Coast Auctions and you're a partner with them. How can people reach you and also enlist you? Yeah, um, I don't really have social media. I'm one of those guys. But um, California Coast Auctions is where I'm at. There's a tab. It says our auctioneers. You'll, you can see a tab that has my bio and videos of me in action if you'd like to check it out. Can't wait. My brother, I'll be seeing you soon. Yeah, Mo. Thanks for the time. Appreciate you, buddy. It's later with Mo Kelly. KFI AM 640. We're live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. Pop quiz. Pop quiz. It's a real question. I need to know the answer before we get into the alpaca haircut teenage uh, frenzy. Seven, what was the last confirmed haircut style that you had? Like you had a name for it. Uh, I guess it would have to be the one I have now because before it was just long and my stylist was like, oh, let's do it this way. And I found out it's actually called the wolf. The wolf. Okay. You got a, a real so. haircut style. Yep. The wolf. Mark Ronner, what was the last haircut style that you had that had a name? Okay. Well, this gets a little awkward because you know what I look like when I get a fresh haircut and I was going to go get one today. It's the clippers on the sides and the back, leave a little length on top. <laughs> and Kind of like the military cut? Uh, kind of like the military cut. And I, I didn't know what to ask for because I kept hearing it called the fashy. <laughs> so I went to my barber and the I'm like... fashy? Yeah, fashy as in the... Fascist? Uh, fascist cut. Yeah. And so I went to the barber and I'm like, I uh, don't know the other word for this, but here's, here's the deal. And he's like... Ah, uh, yes, we call that the gentleman's cut here. <laughs> so, yeah, the, we're calling it the gentleman's cut now. Not okay. The, not the fashy. Tawala, your last haircut, which had a name and style. Ball fade. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Same with me. Ball fade. Ball fade. Can you explain that? Um, the fade haircut, which was somehow remade popular by Travis Kelsey this past football season, <laughs> is actually a haircut which originated within the african-american community it fades up from the skin to just a little bit of hair on top it's it's very similar to a military haircut but a ball fade is so low you're barely above the skin i've grown kind of addicted to watching these barber videos on uh, instagram and i cannot explain why but they do a lot of that yeah yeah Mm -hmm. the ball fade i mean it's a classic it's almost like one of the first haircuts you learn in cosmetology when cutting hair. It's very easy to do. Yeah, they take these guys and they sit them down in the chair looking like a werewolf. And by the time they're done, they look like a human being. I have to keep reminding myself because Tawala keeps burying the lead that he went to cosmetology school. Oh, yeah. Yep. So he knows what he's talking about. Yep. Can you cut my hair, Tawala? I probably could. I oh, like we got to do an Instagram live on that one. <laughs> yes, yes. I'd like the Captain Kirk, please. <laughs> it's, it's been a minute, but yeah, let me brush up. Okay. Well, there is a new haircut for teenage boys, and it's a sensation. It goes by two names. There's the textured fringe, where you have like a fade on the sides, what we've been talking about, and they have these curls on top, like a mop curl cut, but it's faded down on the sides and the back. And it's also called on social media, the alpaca. This is what Morning Edition had to say about it. Okay, we now have important news about hair, specifically the hair of younger men. Yeah, it seems like a lot of teenage boys are getting this one particular haircut. It's a fade on the sides with That's what a I poof said. of hair on the top and sometimes the tendrils dangling down over the eyes. Now we say teenage boys, but I'm sure you have a haircut like this. Used to. Out there in L.A. Anyway, a few months ago, TikTok user Tara Fontana, who goes by the name Terrible Tara, compared it to the look of a certain woolly mammal. Y'all, I have an alpaca son. An alpaca. Harrison Batiste owns Heritage Barber and Company in Kensington, Maryland. He says he gives six or seven of these cuts a week. From 12-year-olds to 30-year-olds. I've seen it on all, ty- all ages. All types. It's, it's, it's a very trendy haircut. 
Now, he doesn't call it the alpaca or its other popular name, the broccoli. Oh, huh? the broccoli. I can picture it. It took me a second there. But he doesn't call it the broccoli. He calls it textured fringe. It's a lot of volume on top. That means like the, the texture of the hair rises. If I could just say like an old mop, like an old mop on top of the head. And then uh, our job is to kind of blend it in. Okay, it's, it's curls on top, fade on the side. It, it, let's not make it more complicated. Picture um, John Travolta's character in Greece with his hair faded on the side. Ah. That's exactly what it is. It is it is almost bouffant-ish mm -hmm. at the top. Uh, the curls aren't as heavy because there's not a lot of product in it, so it can be fluffy and light. But yeah, but it's basically I a fluffy bouffant on the top with you know a nice tight fade. It's the Q-tip. I just I heard yeah. broccoli and I thought Napoleon Dynamite's hair. Mm, yeah, because curly at the yeah. top. Yeah, just yeah. a little more fade, a little, a little more, fade, more tapered yeah. on the sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't know that they could even have a new haircut or hairstyle for young boys or men at this point. I thought we had run the gamut. Nah, I mean, look, hair for young people changes by the decade now every five years even. So, I mean, look, think about all the styles we had from the high top fade to Which the is gummy, back. uh, You know, then they start bringing in, you know, a high top fade with some dreads in the top. Yeah. At least within the African-American culture, you know, and now, of course, Travis Kelsey has brought out uh, the fade and now this is new and now he's got lines and parts in them. I'm like, yes, these, these are all old styles, but men are not, you know, uh, against going and getting tapered up and getting a fresh look. It's not just women who go and get stylized in the chair. Mark, do you know what a Gumby haircut is? I can picture it, but you better tell me since it I is, am half black. It, it is what you may think it is. If you know the character Gumby with the sloped head. Um, you don't want the pokey. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Just no, never freaking mind. No, please mind. continue. No. The Gumby is what you think it is. Bobby Brown actually made it famous. He wasn't the first to have it, but he made it famous because he wore it in his music videos. The Gumby haircut, the sloped afro. Well, oh, who doesn't look good in that? Look, he, 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 some, it, uh, was, it was big. It was a big deal back then. You got to wear parachute deal. pants with it, though, right? And he did. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, but, but look, I had parachute pants, but there are some things which are cyclical. You know, you know, in the way that you have bell bottom pants, which are back in style now, the hairstyles are coming back around. The high top fade is coming back around. You look at um, Stefan's hair. I don't care what they call it. Looks like he's out of 1977. It's the Sasquatch. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like it's, everything old is new again. And I just found it funny that social media now is impacting hairstyles for teenage boys. That's something I hadn't seen before. Teenage girls? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The Gumby is the best way to describe it. it really that's like, is. you're too young to remember it. You wouldn't have any memory of the yeah, Gumby. Yeah, no, I just looked it up. That's oh, yeah. why I'm like, it's that's the that's most exactly what accurate it is. way you can describe yeah, it. It's the Gumby. And, you know, I don't know if kids today have even seen Gumby because I don't see it in syndication anywhere. Oh, come on. Everybody knows Gumby. No, I would not be so uh, sure. No. Because if you don't know the original Gumby, you know the Eddie Murphy Gumby. Kids wouldn't know. You that. know that's 1980s. Oh. I'm not so sure. Come on, no, I'm seriously? being sure. I'm being serious. Ask someone in yeah. their 20s. Wait a minute, Lindsay. Have you ever heard of Gumby? Yes, I have, but only because my cousin is 12 years older than me, and I used to watch his old like uh, VHS tapes. All right. How about this? Are you familiar with the show Davy and Goliath? I've heard of it, but I'm not familiar with it. Oh, Davy. Goliath! None of that? The stop no. motion claymation show? I don't think so. And they'd have a religious a and they'd have a religious message every single oh, show. Yeah. Even I I think, yeah, if she would have if she sees the picture, I think she'll know. Because I, I wasn't sure either until I saw the picture. Yeah, I didn't know because when I was growing up, it's like I just thought it was a not a cartoon, but a claymation type and, and show. And now I'm realizing what uh Oh yeah, I've I've seen this. Yeah, see. Uh, what Robot Chicken does because they have like a, a a parody on that, and I'm like, oh, that's what it's probably based on. Yeah, fun of. and they're playing like a Mighty Fortress is our God is the intro. It's like I didn't know this was a religious show until you get older and realize, hey, this is a religious show. Kids will watch <laughs> any animated thing, and they don't care what it's really no, about. No, they don't. As long it, as it's animated, it had a nice message about you know being a good person and growing up and doing the right thing, and and then you realize because I'm into music, you start. 
playing this music in either church or or the band or what have you, and you realize, oh, that's what that's from. I just thought it was the theme to, to Davy and Goliath. Can you pull it up real quick, Stefan? Theme, Davy, Goliath, YouTube, so people know what I'm talking about. We'll have to edit out the podcast, but that's neither here nor there. At least they'll know what <laughs> yeah, well, You don't want to cease and desist from Davy and Goliath. <laughs> I don't even know the company which was responsible for it. I can't even remember. Uh, uh, was it God? <laughs> <laughs> you are going to hell, my friend. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Lindsay, you have to watch that as part of your your job here, okay. homework assignment. Okay, but also right at the because right, that sound is that putting the the title Davy and Goliath right at the bottom. Copyright the Lutheran Church in America. <laughs> So it was not trying to hide it. <laughs> no, but you're kidding. But I, yeah, I get you it. Know, yeah. you know, oh, they're no. ruthless. Don't uh, don't use anything don't of theirs you without blast permission. Him. Don't you blast them. Oh no, and listen to Mo because he's too legit to quit. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. I miss Kmart. I grew up right around the corner from a Kmart, which was in Harbor City, uh, in the strip mall corner of Sepulveda and Vermont Avenue. And it's a place that I'd hang out with my friends. We'd go there because there was really nowhere to go. We didn't have any money and we didn't have any transportation. So we would go to the local Kmart and cause a ruckus. We would do mischievous things we would go to the stereo area where they had all the radios and and we would set all the alarm clocks to go off at the same time the alarm clock radios and and put all the volumes to 10 and so we would start walking towards the front of the store and then when all the alarm stereos went off at the same time it would be blaring and scare everyone i know it was juvenile it was stupid but that's just the things that we did as kids and kmart was the place to go they had these great burritos. Don't ask me why they were great. They just tasted great to me at the time. But they had these great burritos. It was the place for us to hang out without getting in real trouble. And news has now come down that the last Kmart in America, as far as mainland America, is getting ready to close. All right, well, Kmart soon will be no more. Yeah, on October 20th, the retail giant will close its last full-scale store on the country's mainland. That store located in Bridgehampton on Long Island. Um, so after the location closes, only a small Kmart store will be in Miami and a handful of stores in Guam and the U.S. Virgin Islands. The retailer filed for a Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection way back in 2002. Uh. So you know that means mm. there's hope that in 20 years we'll still have Red <laughs> Lobsters and Express stores around. It's been struggling, of course, to compete with Walmart's low prices and those trending Target stores. RJ and Walmart. Yeah. I, I think it's more than that. Um, I think any retailer is going to struggle in a world where there's Amazon, where we can get something without having to get in our car and driving to the store. We can get it either the same day or the next day. Say what you want about the employee practices at Amazon. As far as the consumer is concerned, there is something very attractive about being able to sit at home, click, 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 and it's on the way. And also you get updates on whether it's been shipped, when it's going to arrive, and you know where this is going to be placed. That type of convenience is very hard to be able to fight against. Yes, Walmart, they have horrible policies as far as its employees. I'm not pushing that aside. I'm just saying lower prices are still lower prices we want to have it both ways we want to have lower prices and also we want better treatment of workers and oftentimes that's in conflict with each other but kmart is one of the many retailers like sears and you know any other one which have fallen by the wayside in the past five to ten years not necessarily a function of the economy but i should say that i would say the the macro economy of the industry of these retailers having to compete against an amazon or even a Walmart in a traditional sense where you just can't compete with the prices that they're offering. You can't compete with the services that they're offering. But I always have a very fond spot in my heart for Kmart. It was a garbage store, but I still have a fond spot in my heart. I did. If you miss it that much, I don't know if you knew this, but YouTube is full 
of Kmart Muzak that you can play. Oh, no, send me the link. Seriously, let me reminisce in that nostalgia, the reverie of Kmart oh, the Muzak. the gang's all here. Let's oh, hang on, hang on. It's I'm about Disney to give it to you. A little, little bit of it right now. That's right. Don't you hate those videos? There you go. Oh, yeah. It's like you're walking toward the blue light special right now. I just feel so relaxed all over. In the mood for a Kmart burrito, are you saying? Yes, I am. Mmm. Mmm. It tasted so damn good. Okay, if I play any more, I'm going to go to sleep, so we'll have to go to the news. Did you ever buy anything on a blue light special? No, but for some reason when I was a kid, that was an insult that was hurled around a lot. It was. Yeah. It was, and I remember, as far as insults go, if you got your shoes or your clothes from Kmart, there was something wrong with you or your family was considered poor. Yeah. It wasn't the highest quality, let's be real. I mean, the shoes, they were like a step below Payless. I'm sure that I had Kmart shoes at some point. Oh, I know I had Kmart shoes, and they were like bricks. They were like wearing bricks on your feet. They didn't fold. They didn't bend. They were not made for wearing. Yeah, and I had to use a pair of Kmart sneakers uh, for track. (laughs) <laughs> and, and it, was, it was like walking around with a pair of cement boots. Right. These, these things are not high-performance <laughs> Nike-type uh, shoes. Not at all. Rest in peace, Kmart, or something like that. KFI AM 640. We're live everywhere in the iHeartRadio app. We're watching everything, so you can watch your sanity. KFI. And KOST HD.